Welcome to the Geneva Academy. My name is Emilie Max and I'm a researcher here. And we have the honor tonight um, to welcome Pierre Crainbull here for um, a discussion and a little debate with Professor Sassoli on the role of international humanitarian law in operations of international humanitarian organizations. Um, for those who don't know him, and I hope there's not many of you, Pierre Granville uh, was um, for a long time the director of operations at the ICRC and also the director general of UNRWA. And of course, Professor Sassoli is the director of this very institution and a professor at the University of Geneva. So without further ado, I'm happy to give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Mini. Thanks, uh, first of all, Marco, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here and to have the, the opportunity to, to uh, share a number of thoughts and observations with you on the basis of this uh, experience of many years in conflict environments and dealing with humanitarian issues. And uh, very happy to have and looking very much forward to the exchange with you and, and raising a number of topics uh, there. I think the first thing that I just want to start with before coming to the actual topic of the interrelation between uh, the law and humanitarian law and humanitarian practice is just a very brief and simple reminder about the fact that obviously when we speak about humanitarian law, when we speak about humanitarian work, we're talking about conflict environments. And what I've found over all these years, and just to start with this thought, is the incredible difficulty to actually convey in any meaningful and truthful way the absolute horror and terror that wars are about. This is the first thing. Because, of course, today we have so many different ways of analyzing conflict. But at the end of the day, whatever and however intense our fascination as societies may be with the issue of waging war, however fascinated we may be uh, in, around the controversies, the political controversies that lead to war, however much interest we spend and time we spend in the evening news looking at shifting front lines and uh, you know, trying to memorize the acronyms of the various armed groups that proliferate around armed conflicts today, the fact is that at the end of the day, when you bring it down to the essential core, armed conflicts are always about human beings, the impact on human beings, the extensive suffering the denial of dignity, of rights, and these types. That's what it is about. So we can look at armed conflicts in all different directions, be fascinated by new weapons systems and their developments. At the end of the day, it is about people. And I've always felt that it's extremely important in every single conversation one has to begin by rejecting the notion that suffering is anonymous. And I reject that with all my soul and the, all my energy uh, in every possible opportunity. Because at the end of the day, whatever it is, suffering, violations, humiliation, abuse, um, the destruction, displacement, disappearance of a relative is always essentially and extremely personal. It is never abstract. It is never something that one can walk away with and simply define through a number of statistics. It always comes down to something extremely personal. And as just one very simple way of illustrating that, I just wanted to begin uh, this particular conversation in exchange with you by simply naming the students, because they were in the work that uh, UNRWA does in uh, the Middle East is among the many things that uh, the organization does, is to run an education system for 500,000 boys and girls from Aleppo all the way down to the Gaza Strip. And that was one of my biggest discoveries uh, when joining the organization was this whole area of education work. And in the many events that affected the region, including the Syrian conflict, but also, of course, what happened in Gaza, notably in 2018 with all these demonstrations that took place, young people going to the separation wall and the fence to protest the lack of prospects. And there was many of these students who, uh, who died, who were killed in these demonstrations in Gaza. And in uh, Syria were the victims of um, artillery, fire, and shelling in the neighborhoods around their schools. And so I just wanted to start by naming those students 
who were killed in that fashion in, in 2018 as part of all of these events. And I do so uh, naming Yasser, and Shadi and Majdi, three young boys in the Gaza Strip, 11 years old. Then there was Ezzedin, who was 13. There was Mohammed, Zakaria, Hussein, Mohammed, and Wissal. Wissal was a young 14-year-old girl, all these 14-year-old. Ala, Muath, and Jamal, 15, Sadi, 16. All these were killed in these demonstrations. And when I say killed, we always have to be careful a little bit about the euphemisms. They were shot by snipers, and this was a deliberate targeting of civilians protesting very largely peacefully. And you can imagine at those ages, we were not talking about anything else than uh, very engaged and desperate youth. And in Syria, among the UNRWA students, there was Kusai, who was 14. Uh, there was Baha, 15. Abdel Ghafur, 15. And Mohammed, 16. And I name them because behind every one of these names, as is behind our names, uh, there is an identity, uh, there was a destiny, uh, there was a hope about something better in life, there was an aspiration to contribute to something in one's country, in one's region, or in the world more broadly. And whether I name now Palestinian youth, or for that matter, uh, Israeli youth who would have been affected by attacks, or whether I name Afghan youth or Colombian youth, or anybody, it, it makes no difference. My point is simply to say we cannot bring humanitarian action and the way we look at conflicts down to statistics. Every one of these events is deeply human and deeply personal. And so with that in mind, turning then to the specific topic of this evening, this inter connection between humanitarian law and humanitarian practice, I will do something which currently is maybe not extremely topical or uh, fashionable, which is to go back to a very defining moment in the development of humanitarian action. And I do so going back to the very origin of where much of it started, uh, at least in, in the Red Cross sense, which is Solferino. And I do that, I evoke it not out of some kind of misplaced sense of nostalgia, for the years of serving in uh, the ICRC, but because there were things that happened on that battlefield of the north of Italy when Henri Dunant arrived there on the 24th of June, 1859, that were very important in my later understanding of what humanitarian action is actually about. Because when Henri Dunant arrived there as a businessman looking for contacts that would enable his business to progress, uh, certainly contacts with the French, as you recall, this battle in Solferino had the French, the Sardinian army, and the Austrian army on the other side. And when Henri Dunant arrived, he saw a battlefield with approximately 40,000 dead and injured all over this battlefield. And he was shocked, horrified by what he saw. And I think anybody would be. But what is very important in what he did was, in my view, the following. First, he did not walk away. He mobilized, together with uh, nurses and civilians in the region, a response. And I'm sure it was incredibly inadequate in many ways in light of the needs on the battlefield, but he did that with the people. But then, equally important in my mind, is what he did after that, which is he didn't leave it at an individual act of charity. He went back to Geneva, he spoke, mobilized, advocated, wrote, and his action and the actions of others then led to the creation of the International Committee of the Red Cross and of, uh, in 1864, the first Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the conditions of the wounded in the armies in the field. And that is extremely important. I, I describe this because I think that is still extremely contemporary in the thinking. It is this back and forth between acting and influencing, acting and seeking to develop the law. Because you cannot leave it at the individual act of charity. You need to find ways to introduce limits to the means and methods that are available to armed forces in the pursuit of their military objectives and, and, and others. And I think that double reflex, as it were, is something that I find quite uh, remarkable uh, 
uh, when one thinks about it. Now, this mutually reinforcing dynamic, in a way, of acting and uh, influencing, as I said, and, and imposing, seeking to impose limits on uh, the opportunities and, and the means and methods to conduct uh, warfare is, I think, still a very central parameter to what humanitarian action should be about today, driven by the needs of people affected and shaped by the rules of uh, humanitarian law and humanitarian principles that I think is still very uh, real today. Now, translated into the day-to-day -day work of thousands of humanitarian workers, uh, Red Cross delegates, and also my own experience, that then, if you take it a step further, there's another very important paradigm that I find central to the humanitarian practice, where you combine the law with uh, the humanitarian response, and that is that you address the consequences of conflict on the one hand, and that is something that we normally associate with distribution of food, distribution of cash, distribution of medicine, of water supplies, and others. But then there is a very fundamental element, which is the dialogue with and the interventions with the parties to the armed conflict. And this is uh, something that leads to negotiating access, to trying to have, uh, uh, to, to influence changes of behavior in the armed forces and in the armed groups. And this can only be done through the patient face-to-face -face dialogue. And I think that paradigm is something that is at the core of what at least my experience was uh, in humanitarian uh, terms. Now, when I think in public terms, one often associates humanitarian action with the first component, which is the distribution of goods, one thinks of the trucks that bring food to different corners of a conflict zone. The second part is, however, the one that I found the most fascinating and the most significant, because it's also extremely difficult to sit down with arms carriers, with governments, with military, with rebel groups, to try and uh, influence a change of behavior is something incredibly uh, demanding. First of all, because it's normally not particularly uh, welcome. And here, international humanitarian law is the fundamental enabler of that dialogue taking place. Without the basis of international humanitarian law, without the existence of the Geneva Conventions, without the mandating of the role, there is no legitimacy, or there wouldn't be the same legitimacy of engaging armed groups now. There can be different practices in that regard, but I think that is very fundamental to uh, my experience. If I approached a military leader somewhere in a field simply on the basis of I want you to change your behavior without the basis of international humanitarian law. I am a private citizen, which, by the way, it can work. But in the ICRC practice, of course, the law is the enabler uh, of the outreach. It gives you the legitimacy to engage in that. And I never forget how unpopular that can be. So we were talking earlier about the famous Abu Ghraib chapter. So the first time I had a US official walk into my office after reading the ICRC's report on uh, the treatment in the Abu Ghraib prison in uh, Iraq. The senior US official had this report in his hand and said to me, surely, and this is a quote, walked into the office and said, surely you do not expect me to believe that what is written here is what was done by our forces in this place of detention. And I said, I don't know what you want to believe or not, but this is what we have documented. And we encourage you to have a look at it and to make up your mind. That was a few weeks before the photographs became public. And so I say, here is this interface between what the law tells us, the benchmarks, the standards, and the ability to translate that into documented interventions to try and influence. But it's never or very rarely welcome. You will rarely find people who thank you for having put it down. And what I found extremely interesting also and important in what IHL does, and it is different to, and I'm surrounded by many experts here, so I, I uh, will let others comment on it, but what I find very, is that international humanitarian law, a little bit differently from human rights law, enables the dialogue to take place not only with governments and official uh, uh, armies, but also with non-state armed groups. 
Now that again is not welcome in many places for political reasons, and it's also extremely difficult. And I'll come back to some of the challenges in a minute uh, that we face. But I think this is, for me, in the humanitarian practice, extremely important, because one thing is to observe that violations take place. Another thing is, how do I develop a narrative? How do I engage a stakeholder on the need to change the practice when I come, and my first assignment was, and I never forget the picture, it's still very vivid in my mind. My first assignment was, I was 26 years old. I arrived in El Salvador. I had a meeting with a senior Salvadoran colonel who had just gone through 10 years of war in his country, and he had to listen to me say something about humanitarian law and something. And I, and I, I still have this image, and I wonder why it was that he would even take the time to sit down with me. What was there that I could contribute? And this always stayed with me as a way of not presenting the law as something mechanic, just simply reciting the articles, but how do I develop a practice of negotiation and dialogue that actually has an impact that would lead a person in the middle of a war zone to think about changing the practice and the behavior? And I think all of us who have been in the field will have, you know, developed certain methods, but this is where I find the interface between law and the actual negotiation and practice one of the fundamental parameters in, in humanitarian uh, action. And IHL, with all its mm -hmm. weaknesses, and I'll come back to some of those, has enabled the, uh, us and in the field to often define and, and, and present or, or let's say develop responses that were very important, like some of us in this room had the experience of the end of the war in Bosnia, where the efforts were to integrate into the Dayton Peace Agreement references to the need to release prisoners at the end of the war, and to establish a mechanism to facilitate exchange of information on the search of missing persons, an absolutely crucial element. You don't have the legal background, you don't have the legal frameworks, you won't have that response. The response will be imperfect as it is because we still don't have answers, of course, to all of the cases of missing persons in Bosnia, but it's an absolutely essential enabler of those things to happen. In the UNRWA case, UNRWA has less of a, a, a protection practice, if you want to call it uh, that, but we had, for example, um, last, over the last two years, worked very closely with a U.S. university on documenting in one particular camp in Bethlehem, Ida camp, which is a very emblematic uh, Palestine refugee camp, where there's extensive use of tear gas. And because it's a highly densely populated uh, area and urbanized landscape, when you use tear gas indiscriminately in those environments, the tear gas doesn't disperse. It goes into homes, it stays in homes, and so the population is incredibly affected. And the university work with UNRWA established that the population in Ida camp was one of the populations on the planet most exposed to the use of tear gas anywhere in, in the world, actually. That was the Berkeley University, that was their findings. And so we put together a report based on references of international humanitarian law, human rights law, and these observations, and it did lead to a change of practice on the side of the Israeli security forces. The number of incidents massively reduced the following year. Now, of course, that has to be followed up in subsequent years. This is what I mean between using law as the enabler and then uh, documenting and intervening. And I think that remains one of the fundamental parameters. Now, the problems that we face in humanitarian law landscapes, and there, this is, of course, a, a very long list, but I think one of the uh, I just wanted to refer to a couple of challenges and dilemmas that, that are very real in, in the, the field of uh, humanitarian law and practice. One is, of course, related to the fact that we have a very profoundly changed landscape in terms of what the conflict environments are about today. Needless to say, and now oversimplifying the Napoleonic Wars, two armies or three facing each other in an open field, and you have essentially, well, Solferino was, if I'm not mistaken, the 40,000 um, casualties were almost essentially, I think minus one person, military, and very, very few civilian victims. Of course, today that ratio has changed, and that has since World War II changed in very dramatic ways. Civilians are at the heart of conflicts, and today there's more and more of the conflicts that we deal with uh, globally that are in heavily urbanized environments, 
We've seen it in uh, Aleppo, we see it uh, in Idlib, we saw it in Grozny, we saw it in Sarajevo, we saw it in Baghdad, and we will see it, and we see it in Gaza and, and elsewhere. And that changes, of course, the way in which one thinks about, again, the interface between the law and, and the humanitarian uh, practice. There's also um, the changing nature of uh, conflict is, of course, very strongly also we observe the duration of average conflicts. If you think of any of the big conflicts that come to your mind uh, on, the, on the planet today, most of them have been in existence for decades. Syria is getting close to that, it's the first decade. Uh, Afghanistan, it's four decades. Uh, Israel, Palestine, it's seven, etc. And you can go on, you will find most of these. Now, it says a lot about a point that I'll come to later about conflict resolution, but it's also, it transforms the way in which we need to think about humanitarian practice, but also about how we deal with the consequences of uh, those conflicts. And it changes, for example, there's two or three things in relation to duration. One, I experienced with UNRWA, and that is the importance of education. And one really has to pay tribute to those who created UNRWA at the very outset and saw education as a fundamental component of the response. It really doesn't exist anywhere else in that way. The direct service delivery, half a million boys and girls in those schools today, with the only element of a horizon that really remains for them is this education component. Of course, health care is important. Food distribution in some cases is that combination. But the education component has to be integrated far more explicitly. And another dimension that was historically very much neglected, and I of course, one always oversimplifies it when one describes it like this, was everything related to mental health and psychosocial consequences. I, can tell, I remember being in Afghanistan and sending a message to the delegation in Kabul at the time, and that was sent to the headquarters, and the message that came back about mental health was, we'll deal with that when the conflict is over. It, I don't think that was particularly insightful, but it certainly means nothing when you know that conflicts last for so long. And so the, the, the mental health problems that uh, populations are confronted with around the globe in conflict environments are something that is simply very, still quite poorly documented, very under addressed, and we need to become much more effective in responding to. And I think it's something, I certainly saw it in, in, in Gaza, but in, throughout Syria you will find it, and it's something which needs far, far more attention. There's also the fragmentation of the conflicts, something that we're exposed to in many contexts, which means it's the average number of actors and armed groups that you have to deal with in one context. And it may sound very basic, but what it means is that the complexities that uh, arise from that is the dialogue that I was describing earlier becomes far more complex. And maybe in the 70s and 80s, or the 60s, you still had the majority of armed groups in the given context that were driven primarily, and again, at the risk of oversimplifying slightly, by ideological or political motives. It was very much still the decolonization period. It was the national self-determination. Rebel groups were very uh, ideologically driven in the sort of paradigm of the Cold War. Today, when you're in the field, you will be confronted with the greatest diversity possible of armed groups in the same context. Some possibly politically driven, others economically motivated, others uh, sort of a mix between the criminal and political, and there's a whole range of actors. And it makes it very difficult for the practitioners on the ground, first of all, to identify what is the basis on which you will negotiate with these parties. Is it the law? And what are the limits then? Uh, of uh, that negotiation with uh, groups that would be driven primarily by, say, criminal motives. They are in control of a few gold mines or coltan mines in the DRC. Where do you engage them and where is your justification to find it? And this is something which has, of course, transformed the landscape and the way in which uh, humanitarian organizations work, uh, I think, uh, very, very profoundly in, in, in that regard. Now, I think it will remain true, but the future will tell us, that this back and forth that exists uh, very much in between practice, the observation of evolving needs, and uh, the reality of development of the law is going to uh, be one that requires ongoing 
very strong engagement by civil society and international organizations. Because yeah. frankly speaking, we can simply, with all due respect, not trust states to do the right thing alone. We, of course, there will always be alliances with states who think the right things. But fundamentally, here is a very important part where we cannot take it for granted that developments will go in the right direction. And I was very proud always in working in humanitarian environments while responding to needs in the field to see that there were other colleagues in the same organization that were thinking about how to take a given problem and transform it into a new uh, initiative on the development of the law. So let's take an example. We know the context of the Lebanese war, 2006, the cluster munition problems led to a, a mobilization internationally that led to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. The same was earlier the case on mines, very important, and I'm sure with colleagues of ICRC in the room that we will see other initiatives on the automated weapon systems, on artificial intelligence, on everything, on computer network attacks, and all the effects that we're still to see in the development of warfare in the, in the future that, uh, that is required. And there, there is a back and forth that is needed, a mobilization, because civil society and international organizations help create an environment and shape new and evolving consensus around some of these themes based on the practice in the field. And here I just want to say, again, it's a back and forth between you could never credibly approach a state to highlight that you are convinced that a new legal framework is needed or a new treaty is needed if you had not the practice and the observations from your fieldwork. It was literally the, the events of 2006 and the consequences of the use of cluster munitions that could be documented and that led to a change and an evolving uh, consensus in that regard. I think that is extremely important and will uh, continue to be so. Now, I think the other point, maybe the one that I found the most difficult to um, find the right response to, is we know that international humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions give far, are, let's say the backbone is much stronger in international armed conflicts. And the rules that apply to what is today the majority of conflicts, which are internal, or in the, uh, legal language, the non-international armed conflicts, is a much weaker uh, backbone. And so you have to be even more creative in trying to exert your influence through the negotiations to convince parties, and that that was certainly one very big challenge. The dilemmas that you face in humanitarian practice are also well known. So let's give another example from the Balkans. We know that humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions say that civilians should be protected where they are and where they live and spared from the effects of war. The problem with conflicts like the Bosnian one is that the very objective of the parties through ethnic cleansing was the removal of a given community. How do you deal with that irreconcilable paradigm between what the law says and what you should be advocating for and telling the parties you may not attack these groups and what the intention of the party is. And so you get into some very fundamental dilemmas of humanitarian practice, and I know it, I lived it in Banja Luka. Uh, a few weeks after the Srebrenica massacres, we had to decide what to do in response to very direct threats to 50,000 civilians uh, Croats and Bosniaks in that area of the Serb Republic, what later became the Serb Republic of, uh, in, in Bosnia, and we had to decide. And so what do you do with that dilemma? Well, we decided that it was better to help evacuate that population, but of course, in doing so, we always had at the back of the mind that we were maybe contributing to the very objective of the removal. But had we decided to stay simply principled and on the law, we may have abandoned people to their fate. And I have always preferred the dilemmas associated to being present on the ground and responding and saving lives. And I think that will always remain. But it's just to describe that there's nothing perfect in the world of how you translate legal frameworks into actual response on the ground. And the same is absolutely true for the Palestinian territories, because the law of occupation, of course, states clearly and unambiguously that it is first and foremost the responsibility of the occupying power to provide for the population under occupation. 
That not being the case, and on the contrary, we see through settlement expansions and others, constant violations of that very body of law, the humanitarians in the context find themselves in the dilemma of shooting for the responsibilities, in this case of Israel, while being drawn into enabling the occupation to continue. And that is a very fundamental dilemma. How do you resolve it? It's not easy. There is no clear-cut answer. Some actors will choose one form, others another. But this is also just to show uh, the number of dilemmas uh, that uh, are there and that accompany us. I, am, I feel very strongly, in addition to uh, the need to reject anonymity and suffering, I feel very strongly currently about the great importance to mobilize, however, with all the imperfections of humanitarian law and many other instruments, to mobilize in defense of these instruments that we inherited from World War II. So I think here of the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Geneva Conventions, the 1951 Refugee Convention. These instruments, this, these pieces of the multilateral system that was built up after World War II are under attack, massively, seriously, and problematically. And we need to mobilize because if you think that it took World War II to obtain those instruments that anybody in their right mind would today think that we can simply abandon and neglect them uh, is, for me, highly problematic. And yet that's exactly what is happening now. And I experienced it with many other colleagues in the ICRC after uh, September 11, where there was, in particular, in the Western world, uh, sort of a an, an attack, an all-out attack, a deep and profound questioning of the relevance of the Geneva Conventions. This was true in political circles, in military circles, in academic circles, and elsewhere. And my favorite quote of that time was when pe someone said, the negotiators of 1949, in other words, the military and uh, diplomats who actually drafted the Geneva Conventions and then adopted them, had not anticipated a world with Al-Qaeda in it. That was the quote that we had from some. Now, I'm sure that it's factually correct that the negotiators in 1949 had not thought about Al-Qaeda, but they didn't have to, because they had just survived the greatest calamity that mankind, and in this particular instance, I think we can underline mankind, um, had ever inflicted on itself. Everything that those negotiators had in mind was from the Holocaust to Hiroshima, from Dresden to Coventry, from every possible horror that was inflicted. And what they came up with was that minimum basis, those few rules that we obtained out of that horror. And to think that we would today question the relevance of those rules. as well. What we need to do, of course, is to enrich, strengthen, further develop, yes, definitely but not to question open it. And exactly the same paradigm happened with the refugee questions and migration after the summer of 2015, um, when so many Syrians and Afghans and others arrived in Europe. Suddenly, there was the same pattern, the same comments about the relevance of the refugee convention. And one of the things I just want to highlight here in relation to that is I find highly problematic that questioning by, and of course, International humanitarian law is certainly not questioned only by the Western world. Let's be very, very clear about that. There are many, many parts of the world where international law is questioned, challenged, and the multilateral system is challenged. But I think there is a particular responsibility out of the West in this regard. And why? Because one of the notions that is so present in the debates around international law in general, but let's stay with the international humanitarian law, is its universality. Okay. Now. What, is, what I have observed over all these years is that what people, what, what is actually an, an objective fact is that the Geneva Conventions are probably the most, if not, it's probably the most ratified instrument of international law. Okay, so it is in that sense, through the ratifications, universal. But when you declare something universal, the strange thing is, you know how human beings are, is for, the, for us the test is always in whether the other applies it. When in fact, universality, in order to be credible, has to start at home. It only works if you are prepared to apply it to yourself. Because we know, 
how much energy and creativity goes into, um, by almost every state on the planet, and certainly in the West, in addressing comments to other states about their need to behave appropriately, respect the rules of human rights, of humanitarian law. But of course, if at the very moment where your own security is at risk, you put your commitments on the back burner and have and allow yourselves Abu Ghraib, or you allow yourselves what happened with uh, refugee arrivals and all the debates and the reactions that created, then the message that you're giving to the world is actually that these, you do not consider them universal, you consider that they apply to others. And that undermines the very credibility that the law has to be based on. And here the practice of states is something extremely challenging and we need to be very, very active in challenging that practice uh, through a variety of means bilateral confidential conversations, public demarches, whatever it is. My final comment on, on this is that I, after all these years of working in the field, and you've seen it through all the comments that I've made, of course, when you work in the humanitarian field and you deal with humanitarian law, you deal with the reality that you accept that wars exist. And that's not always, at least when I was a student, I didn't find that a very attractive proposition, I have to tell you. In fact, when I was a student, almost just next door in what used to be Ashri, and that led me away from humanitarian law for a while. Because I found that difficult to accept that you have to accept that wars take place. Now, after 30 years of working in wars, applying humanitarian law, I think it is also very important to reject the notion that wars are inevitable. And I say this because I have just no longer the ability to reconcile myself with the human consequences of these ongoing conflicts. And I find that um, in the sense of the collective consciousness that we all represent through our work, through what we believe in, the notion that we simply accept that wars are inevitable is what relieves political decision makers of their responsibilities to assume political action in response to conflicts. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the last two decades, and, and again, to oversimplify, let's take it from September 11 onwards, two main strategies have been pursued and given preference by the international community in response to conflicts. The military strategies, in military interventions, and I have to tell you, there are very, there's very, very little documented evidence that any of those interventions that you can come up with in your mind has ever contributed to improving the stability of the regions where they took place. I have no example in my mind just now. Now, some people will say, yes, Kosovo or somebody, but the reality is I cannot come up with, it's not in Afghanistan, it's not in Iraq, it's not in Libya, it's not in Yemen, it's not in Syria. You can't see it. So to simply allow military interventions to dominate as the form of dealing with Conflict realities is, I find, a very misplaced and problematic approach. The other strategy has been by the international community to support humanitarian responses, which, of course, I should advocate for, and I believe in deeply, and I know the necessity uh, to lead them, but I also know, like we all know, that they don't address the core or the causes of the conflict itself. And so what you're left with is two forms of strategies, military interventions and humanitarian support, that don't address the fundamentals. And that is why, even in research institutions and in academic circles, you will find, and I've seen it a lot, and happy to be challenged on that, that there is an overemphasis, in my view, on conflict management. Conflict management, you can manage conflicts for decades. And I always told people who complained about UNRWA still being in existence, manage the Israel-Palestine conflict and you get 70 years of UNRWA. No doubt about it, and you'll get 80 years of UNRWA, and 90 years of UNRWA, and 100 years of UNRWA. If you manage conflicts, managing conflicts is accompanying a situation. Resolving conflicts is what is needed. And it is a, an extremely weak component of today's international system. It's catastrophically weak. And I say it because every day humanitarian workers, not to mention people affected, live and are exposed to the consequences of the lack of political will, lack of political courage. How many times in um, ministries in Europe have I been confronted on the Israel-Palestine question with the skepticism 
people said, I'm very skeptical about the prospects of peace between Israel and Palestine. I always told them, you don't have the luxury of being skeptical because the consequences are such, and they spill over uh, the region, they spill over into Europe. We don't have the luxury of being skeptical. We have to reinvent, redevelop new forms, a different consensus, and there are practitioners of that in the room, around conflict resolution. We need to prevent wars, resolve wars, end them, oppose them if needed, but we cannot continue to live with this paradigm of simply managing conflict. And out of that, I leave it for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Sarkozy, if, if you dare, take me. Well, I, I hope now to defend humanitarian law, but the, so it doesn't need to be defended because I think you did that uh, in a way in which I agree with all the all your statements about law. Um, probably the only disagreement is about history, but uh, this is not my specialization. The, the, and it was marginal. I mean, the, uh, you know, I hear it often this story about only one person dying in Solferino. And um, I mean, no, the, the reality is not that wars have become more inhumane. If you think only about uh, the Spanish Civil War, if you think about Napoleon besieging Zaragoza, after the siege of Zaragoza, half of the inhabitants were dead. Uh, Aleppo, I'm not sure that half died. But obviously, the essential difference is that at the time, we didn't have the same rules than we have today. And therefore, I agree with you that it is totally shocking that today, with these rules, we still have uh, these results. So all I can do is perhaps to add some, some issues and perhaps to ask you some things which are not really a reaction to what you said. Um, now, on the what I would uh, what I would add is perhaps uh, that uh, yeah, I fully agree with you. Uh, from another perspective, it is inherent in law that it applies to future situations which were not foreseen, um, and this is uncontroversial in every. Uh, branch of law um, and I'm rather the person who always uh, says okay we have to try to uh, find um, I mean with good legal reasoning you can solve nearly everything my personal opinion is even artificial intelligence and um, cyber is a more delicate thing where there is a, a, a real fundamental problem that the very paradigm of the law does not really fit with that uh, environment. Uh, by the way, when I speak about cyber and artificial intelligence, uh, you made a very important remark that uh, one is much more powerful when one deals with issues which are based on field experience. Obviously, that's the problem with cyber and artificial intelligence. Fortunately, I would say that today, if you want to uh, deal with those issues, for instance, the ICSE can, by definition, not say this is based on field experience, but this can be replaced by uh, scientific evidence, say, what, uh, how the health system is today very much uh, based on uh, internet um, connections uh, and so on. Obviously there there is a, a dilemma I would have liked uh, to hear you uh, about uh, to say um, if we pay much attention to artificial intelligence, cyber, all kind of new technologies, well I mean the people actually die from quite old technologies um, 
whether you would say we need as much emphasis on both or uh, also as a humanitarian practitioner say let's let's put the priority on the issues which are also more difficult because finally a discussion on cyber yes it's difficult but states don't get really angry at you while if you say um, explosive weapons in populated areas. This is clearly directed against some states. So is it simply easier to speak about space war and things like that because no one feels directly criticized? Or would you say no, it is important to deal, uh, to prevent ideally uh, obviously wars, but also if there is an armed conflict that uh, some new means which were not yet used in warfare uh, uh, will be used. I mean, I, I think the example that comes to mind is the laser. Mm, yes, the use that's of laser a good one. Mm. So there, is, there are some examples of where uh, work was done ahead of the actual development or use of such and I think it's good. I think one should be. I, I think organizations, or the, the, if you want, the international system, mm -hmm. again, should be able to look at both the response of today, the needs of today on the field, and uh, forward-looking in the sense of developments, because it is going to go very, very quickly. Actually, on some of the issues. I mean, I think the we had I, I, in one session that I attended in, in in the UN context, the the ability today of robots to not only carry out a task but to learn. Mm -hmm. is, is starting to be a very serious issue. And so, so of course, when they become then autonomous, in this, it's not just autonomous in they can go out in the field and do something like a drone that still has to be flown. Somebody has to give the instruction to actually fire. But all the questions of command and control, if the, 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 the artificial intelligence and robotic system become autonomous in part of their decision making and how they adapt, then it becomes a whole new thing. So I think it is very important that there are people who are looking into that while others are in the field dealing with today's uh, uh, realities. Thank you. Um, inevitably, from an operational point of view, the law is a means to get a result. And you were very forceful in uh, speaking and reminding us that it is about human beings. Uh, now, obviously, one of the illusions of the lawyers is also that the law could uh, work even without operations, that somehow the law is beside uh, even those victims which can never be reached by a humanitarian organization. And there the question is obviously when one sees the law as a means in negotiation, Understandably, one would say, okay, I don't invoke the law if I know that this is rather counterproductive. But if you do it in too many occasions, you weaken uh, the law, especially if it is precisely the organization which is the guardian of the law. I don't say publicly, but bilaterally and confidentially, and I fully understand how uh, that it is a non-starter to invoke certain rules with certain parties. Uh, but uh, then you inevitably weaken the law even if you continue to teach it and it leads to double standards. i give you just a little example I heard in Kiev. Uh, someone from the ICSC had to, to answer the question, well, do you consider that Crimea is an occupied territory? And the person said, um, it is not to the, uh, up to the ICSC to classify a territory. Obviously, when the Israelis hear this, then <laughs> they... <laughs> That's fine. And therefore, uh, but this is an inevitable, okay. This was a public statement, otherwise I wouldn't have heard it. And there I can understand that one has to, I would have formulated it in a different way, in a more transparent way, simply saying, you know, if we want to help people, we have to speak with those who have control over those people, and, uh, and so on. But 
underlying is uh, a real dilemma to say, uh, do we sometimes, because I understand that in some cases, Crimea, there's not a big humanitarian problem to the best of my knowledge, sorry, but in many other contexts where you can't invoke the law, you can't then invoke, for instance, the law of occupation or uh, international humanitarian law at all, and this weakens the protection possibilities, while if you invoke it, they don't let you, let you in, and therefore, at least for these victims, it's always better if you don't invoke but do you see the dilemma or would you say no, but as I have to care about victims, I need access, and if I don't have access anyway, the law cannot help? I mean, maybe just to start the answer with um, maybe a more symbolic way of illustrating it. When we used to discuss inside teams, you know, what, what, because we, you always refer to a legal framework, yeah. And just already the, the image of a framework means you're inside it, and then you you know you bounce off the mm. different sides of it, and you. And I always thought, and again, that at least in, in terms of practice that I uh, that I had, that I always saw the the, the legal frameworks, in other words, the, the the law, IHL, the Geneva Conventions, and the humanitarian principles as a component of one's operational backbone. And in other words, the backbone is there both to be flexible enough to create in the field, to respond to needs, to be pragmatic and tactical when you need to, but you can't bend the backbone so far uh, until you know there's a point where it breaks. So it also so, so what I liked always in the in the ICRC context, and and I did experience that in UNRWA as well because I found which was very refreshing that UNRWA also had a much smaller but a tradition of very operational lawyers in uh, the legal department, that it was very necessary for me to have this back and forth with the lawyers, even if we would disagree at times on some of the, inter not so much on the interpretation, but on the how forceful you are in then pushing for something, because on the ground you need to negotiate and you need a bit of flexibility. But if you don't have... The, the lawyers reminding you of what the parameters are, then you become too flexible. And then is the moment where you may cross too many times a given line until it becomes irrelevant in the future. So I think it's this healthy dynamic between the two mm. that keeps you on your toes and as focused as possible. And of course, there are plenty of examples, I presume, where we could say uh, that we felt constrained by some of the legal reasoning and others where l lawyers will say, well, actually, you were too flexible and that's, that's this necessary back and forth. So I, I never found, on, on one point that you raised, I think there's just something that I want to add, because in particular in, in the ICRC's case, it's, it, it is historically invoked, which, is the, the, uh, which isn't the principle, by the way, it's, just, it's a modality, which is confidentiality. Now, um, confidentiality is, I think, s something very important in the work and the field, but one of the risks of confidentiality is how, what do you do under confidentiality? So if I sit down with an armed group somewhere, or with a military officer, or a government official, and I say, just to use your example, also publicly, well, I can't tell you about what we discussed because it's confidential. The measure of it is, of course, how serious was that conversation? Mm -hmm. Because if below confidentiality you actually have a generic conversation only about access a little bit and maybe getting to know each other, etc., then it's actually you're not using confidentiality for what it should be used for. Confidentiality is to create a protected space in which very unpleasant things can be said. But then you have to be sure. And, and, and I say this because it is not easy. Right? So I... I Everyone who has been in the field remembers and knows that if you sit down with an, an arms carrier somewhere, you're in a very, very uncomfortable position when it comes to speaking about violations carried out by that group, abuse, or others. It's not an easy thing to do. So the risk of confidentiality is a bit, you know, you blur the message below, you obviously slightly overemphasize it in the minutes of meeting you sent back to the headquarters. <laughs> and I always said in ICRC training and elsewhere, the most interesting minutes of meeting are the other ones. Those are the ones you should be reading, if anybody wrote them, is, is what the person on the other side understood of your message. 
Because your own minutes of meeting one always tends to exist everywhere. And I said in no uncertain terms, etc. Mm. But in fact, you kind of highlighted and reminded of the generic. And that's where the test lies. Do we find the, the, the stamina, the strength, sometimes the courage, or the, 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 the wisdom and the approach to say to somebody, you, your forces went through that village, pillaged, abused, raped, we documented it, here it is, can't deny it, you have to change that practice. It takes a lot of guts and it's very, very demanding. And so that is where we have to be careful that we don't invoke some of the instruments to divert from what the real message should be. If we are able to say it, and at times it takes months and years to get to proper conversations in that regard, then uh, confidentiality is justified. If, if we hide behind it to have a sort of a non-discourse on the law or on the violations, then I think we're diverting from what the whole principle should be about. Perhaps I have just one question of curiosity because um, until very recently our students were, understandably as lawyers, very fascinated by international criminal law and criminal prosecution and I'm still confronted to plenty of journalists who are frustrated because they ask me, is this a war crime? And I tell them, I can tell you it's a violation of humanitarian law. Well, to know whether it's a war crime, I would need to know who had uh, uh, knowledge and intent and whether an individual and it was a mistake and so on. Uh, but do you think that criminal prosecution, which has become much more unfortunately, insufficiently, but nevertheless, more a reality in the last 30 years, um, which is also a little obstacle to humanitarian action, but would you overall say, nevertheless, that it is a big progress? I mean, I would say that it's absolutely necessary when you, when you see what happens in the field, when you see what people go through, and what uh, sometimes is uh, allowed to, encouraged or even instructed to, to happen in terms of the, the types of violations, whether it's torture or anything else. And of course, there should be far more robust mechanisms to hold people to account. And that is, in and of itself, I think would be probably in the eyes of many people in the context affected more important than to know whether they're going to get another round of food distribution. No? So I think there, if you would ask people, it's not for any organization to say, yes, this could interfere with my work. It's the, what would the people say on the ground? And I think they feel very, very strongly that accountability is something uh, extremely important. Now, we know that currently things are imperfect. There are a variety of views. And it brings us back to one of these issues of perceptions, because it was not specifically addressing your point. But I never forget a conversation with a and that was in the ICRC years with the, uh, the then foreign minister of, uh, of Brazil who said, look, we know how these things work. And he was referring to the responsibility to protect because the Brazilians had just for a while referred to the responsibility while protecting. They had to develop that notion. And that was just after the Libya issues uh, and everything. And he said, we know how these things work. A concept is coined in the West, tested in Africa, and then imposed on all of us. That, and that, here we talk not about a, you know, it's a foreign minister of a country. And that's how it is perceived. Now, wh whether we agree with that characterization or not is not the point. It is, that is how many of those things are felt. And certainly in terms of uh, the international so the criminal and the prosecutions, that debate is there with the International Criminal uh, Tribunal and others with uh, the focus on Africa and others. There, of course, we are still lagging behind a system that is more systematic and consistent. And I think it is, uh, that would be very, very important, that there would be more done. Uh, it would certainly send a much stronger message to the parties on the ground. Then there's a completely different debate, which is on the back and forth between justice and peace, and how societies decide in a debate, as was done in South Africa and elsewhere, uh, 
how you lead a conversation inside the country to overcome the traumas of a particular phase in your history, and then how you find and reconcile between the emphasis on justice and the emphasis on peace and moving forward. And that is, I think, for societies to debate, and that's not now for a humanitarian pr practitioner to define. I think it's very important that those steps are taken. But um, yeah, I, would, I think I'd leave it at that. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? Wonderful. Go ahead. As nice as possible, but I agree with uh, virtually everything you've said. Uh, just for, to let you know what informs my viewpoint, uh, I'm a retired U.S. Army officer. I'm a Guantanamo defense attorney, still in an appellate case. Been immersed in this stuff since 2008, Amazing. the torture debate, even before that. Uh, coincidentally, uh, I watched a Georgetown Law School uh, program today and then corresponded with some of the people on there on, on an email list I'm on. Uh, on the topic of torture. And the frustration I have as a Guantanamo defense attorney and U.S. Army officer is the refusal by so many people, mostly uh, civilians but, and, and mostly attorneys, to acknowledge what I know from having been, my, my career started uh, trained as a military, uh, Marine Corps rifleman, been in PSYOPs, been in infantry, uh, before becoming an attorney finally and a, and a JAG officer. And so I'm, I'm quite familiar. I got trained by the Marine Corps at the end of the Vietnam War. So we had returning Vietnam War veterans all the time telling us stories of the atrocities they committed. A good friend of mine is a retired general who was charged at the end of the Vietnam War to investigate all allegations of U.S. war crimes. And he confirmed every single one, with maybe, maybe one or two exceptions, just to not put words. So the refusal by the international community to look objectively at the United States, and I would point out, uh, I'm assuming upon armed, and Clausewitz, Clausewitz said war is never an isolated act, meaning there's always something that precedes it. And refusal to look at US policy and peel it back and go back to the 1990s where the end of the Cold War, we declared in various ways that we now have military dominion over the world. And groups like Project of the New American Century called for war against seven countries. And General Wesley Clark said right after 9-11, he was told in the Pentagon that we had a list of seven countries that we were going to take down one after the other. But yet, the international community refuses to condemn us uh, adequately. The uh, United States, we uh, today in the conversation, over 50% of U.S. citizens now agree that torture is, is permissible. We're, we're deteriorating so fast, but we get no criticism of it. We don't because we're loyal Americans in the United States. The international community starts to acquiesce us to all of this. The ICC finally uh, is going to investigate war crimes in Afghanistan to a degree. Uh, I'm, I'm officially an Afghan war veteran because of Guantanamo. But we have given impunity to so many. I mean, all of their military officers, CIA officers involved with torture, etc., where they can't even bring a civil suit against them for damages because they're all dismissed. So I guess my question is, when or how do you expect for all these atrocities to change when we continue starting wars? And I'm, I'm saying something that military officers say, Larry Ropers and others, I'm not some aberrational left-wing retired U.S. Army officer. I'm saying what a whole lot of military people say. Uh, when are we going to get some criticism for our war crimes and demand accountability for what we've done over the last 20 years? Very remarkable um, to mention because it, it reminds many of us in the room of the, the many chapters that we have engaged. Uh, with the, the U.S. on. And it's interesting because uh, at least what I remember from discussions we had is that colleagues who worked in the ICRC in, in the Vietnam chapter felt that that was a time where even at the level of the organization there not enough had been done to document what was carried out by U.S. forces and others and, and the, the impact of military operations and the consequences on civilians and that there isn't really a structured as far as I recall what uh, some of our colleagues had described, where you would intervene with the U.S. forces to document and to what I was talking about earlier, try and change the patterns of behavior and the way in which military operations were conducted. And that was one of the defining features. When the post-9-11 events happened, we were determined internally not to allow at least that gap to, to happen and not to, to be in a position where coming out of Afghanistan or Iraq, we would one day, as ICRC uh, representatives say, we didn't try hard enough. We may fail in getting the message through, 
we may fail in having the impact we would want in terms of the beer, but we would never want to look back and say, we didn't put this in writing, we didn't have the Dimash. And that's exactly why this famous report on Abu Ghraib that was then leaked to the, uh, from, from within US circles, was leaked to the Wall Street Journal and created this big debate and tension, was probably, although we were horrified at the time that a confidential document was released in this way, because that's not the practice that ICRC has, but did lead in at least our discussion with the US it, it, it focused the energies, and I would now leave it to others to see how that has continued, because that's a chapter I know less of in the last uh, five to six years. But it was very clear that the example that I gave earlier about this senior US official saying, you do not expect me to believe, that the next step in the story, which I should just, to his credit, I must just add, a few weeks later he came back, because he had by then seen the photographs, and the conversation we had from then on was a very different one. Right? Because then there was at least a recognition, as you indicate, by a number of actors inside that things had happened that were simply intolerable for many who serve in the US armed forces and thought that things like this should never happen and were certainly extremely negative in terms of the fallout reputation-wise, in terms of uh, the respect and the training that uh, the military had gone through, whatever the lines of argumentation. But I think I can only agree with you that the international community, and it's, a, you know, it's always a bit of a vague notion, you know, where's the address, right? So, so, but the international community is weak on confronting violations by a certain actors. There's no doubt about that. I mean, there's definitely double standards in the way in which uh, the communication publicly is taken up. And certainly in terms, if you think back to what happened in Iraq and what happened in Afghanistan, the cases in the US that have gone through and been you know, people put on trial or held accountable for, you, know, you, can't, you can't really identify. There's nothing there that you can work with and go back to other countries and say, no, they took this very seriously. Once they identified this, they did that. Right? You, you can't really refer to any. And that, I think, is, is indeed very problematic. Another example that is at another end of the spectrum is, is in language. We see the international community withdrawing from language that is enshrined in international humanitarian law. You were talking earlier about the, the law of occupation, so I've just gone through it. You can see everywhere there people are retreating from using even the word occupation mm -hmm. when it comes to what is happening in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory. And here I'm talking not about a political view. This is what is often, people often confuse that. I can understand that it's interpreted in a political context, but the fact is law applies. And the law of occupation in the context of Israel and Palestine applies. And yet, you can see in international fora, I saw it in UN meetings, I saw it in international meetings, I see it in the European context, people are withdrawing from even referring to the language of it. So by that time, we know we are in trouble, because here is a context where it actually strongly and firmly applies, and yet we are not any more prepared to actually use to and refer to the law that is at hand. And that should be our guiding principle in defining what is permissible and what isn't. And that's where we are in a highly politicized environment that will undermine what the law stands for and how it should apply. And so I, I you know, can only welcome your comments on that because I think it is very important that people are held to account. And so there are a number of issues in Iraq and Afghanistan that would certainly warrant that. Well, I, I, just on the, on the counterterrorism point, I think it's very, I found it very interesting with you, Scott, because you gave it a, a very broad view of it, right? So you say it's, it's intruding in, or interfering in many, many parts. Mm -hmm. It's clear that in the humanitarian response side, it is becoming a very significant factor, right? Because more and more mm -hmm. um, of the contracts that you sign and agreements and donor agreements are, of course, filled with clauses and other things that are related. And that, yeah. in one way or another, impacts the ability in the field to conduct the operations you know, along the usual set of paradigms. So that, that, that is a part I think it's underestimated by those who are pushing for their inclusion of how that is going to translate at one point into narrowing not so much the space because I'm actually not somebody who believes in the existence of or a pre-existing humanitarian space. You know, we always say the shrinking humanitarian space. I never believed that there was such thing because there's, it's, it always came to my mind that there's a bit this image of you drive in your humanitarian vehicle, you arrive, and then there's a sign on the road, you're now entering humanitarian space. So it's like the twilight zone or something. 
um, there is no such thing as a humanitarian space pre-existing in a conflict environment. You create it through your negotiations, through the uh, way you influence parties about the reminder of the law or of humanitarian principles and others, but it's very fragile. And so when these counterterrorism clauses are now introduced, it makes it, it weighs down the effort, it makes it more complex. And I, I, it's not that one doesn't understand some of the concerns at the heart of what was put forward. You can always debate it. But it is weighing down, it's impacting organizations in ways that will be problematic down the line, no doubt. It is already, but it will become more. And people underestimate that this is going to constrain the ability of engaging. And if I can just create one link between those themes, because it's not what you addressed directly, but I just want to mention that. When we talk about engaging um, non-state armed groups, which is still in many places around the world very uncomfortable for governments. And one can, one can see the rationale and the reasons why it's uncomfortable. But what I find equally uh, problematic is that you always hear these narratives of don't engage, don't talk to, and it's particularly strong accompanied with the terrorism language, right? Mm -hmm. Don't talk to the terrorist groups, don't talk to, so you, you label and define. And it's so interesting that, it, and it's so predictable of what has now just happened again in the case of Afghanistan. Because it is always the same thing. Every time it's the same to the point of exhaustion. That states say, we will never talk to until they talk to. And it's so exhausting. So you spend, and we've now wasted 18 years in the Afghan context, saying we will not talk to, for some obscure and bizarre principle that is that one doesn't talk to the opposing side in a conflict, when in fact that's the only way you bring about peace, is you bring about by engaging. And it's not comfortable and people are unhappy about it and those families who have lost uh, a close relative in the fighting are not happy and they don't want, but it's, and, and people are always skeptical. Imagine in Northern Ireland, the year before the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. So how many people were skeptical versus those who were not. Yes? Thank God they didn't consult only the skeptical. Thank God there were some people who said, yes, we're all very skeptical about the prospects, but we're now going to do it. I always said to people in European context who kept telling me how skeptical they were, ministers and others, about the possibility to achieve peace between Israel and Palestine, I said, imagine we are 1946. I'm the German, you're the French. We're filled, a room filled with people who have just come out of World War II. How many people on average do you think were skeptical or opposed to the idea that one would build a different future? Thank God the skeptical didn't win the vote. People took it up and said, we had the war in 1870-71, we had the first World War, we had World War II, now we're going to dare something different. Thank God and they imagined a different environment. But why? Because they talked to one another. So this whole principle of not engaging is so absurd. And one of the least useful concepts in the entire UN construct is the no contact policy. Mm. So people dance around this, not talking to one side, not talking to, whether it's Hamas or others. Mm. At the end of the day, people will have to sit down and negotiate peace in one form or another. And it will always be with the party that you have been fighting. And it's so illustrative that how many times have I heard, again, in the context of US or the international force deployment in Afghanistan, we will never until it now happened. It's so predictable. And thousands of lives have been unnecessarily lost in the 18-year interim. And that's really unacceptable. And that's where we need to create new ways of thinking around dealing with these conflict environments. It's just not acceptable that we would stay at that type of response. Sorry, it's okay, delayed. Yeah, one last question. It was precisely um, related to what has been discussed. Uh, there's a professor uh, on negotiation, Robert McKean, uh, who says that you can negotiate with the devil uh, when what you are going to obtain is uh, something that's really important and good for the greater uh, also the population, right? And he raised an example of Mandela. Mm. But uh, uh, aside my question was about that, I talk about resolving conflicts and um, peace agreements issues, and I was thinking in the case of the um, Colombia peace agreement, 
uh, the state with the uh, FARC, and also with reduction of uh, criminal sanctions, but also incorporating some of them into political life. Right? So, uh, how to reconcile uh, the need of uh, peace? Ooh, Colombia was such a long conflict, really the second uh, until it ended yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. in the world, and, uh, and the need of justice. Because also in this non international armed conflicts, uh, case of Colombia, also of my country of origin, uh, Peru, uh, you have victims in the army, you have victims in the civilians, among the civilians, you have victims even also in the member of this, among the members of these groups, I mean, people that were uh, killed in a not a, a lawful manner. Right? So how to, um, how much forgiveness can be allowed, how much, uh, uh, also, uh, on how to guarantee this, the, the idea that they are also receiving justice and reparation. <laughs> yeah, that I, I think that's so important. And what's so interesting for me about the, the example of um, of Colombia, just to start one first connecting point with my earlier remark. Mm -hmm. So, who would have thought that of all the people who at one point would decide that it was enough to continue on the military path was the former Minister of Defense? Yeah. And who then became President Santos and decided. And so here I am, the, mili the Minister of Defense, who was actually waging the war against the FARC, uh, leading the whole uh, operation from a security perspective. And I come to the position of President, and I realize, and this is how I, I presume this happened, a very shortened and simplified version of all the dilemmas and debates. Now it is time to do something else. And I think it takes incredible courage. And I don't know the details of you know, what were the discussions and mm -hmm. what the paradigm was. Mm -hmm. But I think that is exactly when you realize that uh, there is also the possibility to have the courage at one point to think differently. Now, before coming to the peace and justice part, there's another couple of things. I, was, I remember very clearly a conversation with a senior Indian editor in Delhi, and we were two colleagues in, in, in the ICRC. And my colleague, who's, we started the conversation, it was around lunch, and you know, it was one of my early visits to India, and so they was trying to connect, to get a better understanding. And at one point, my colleague said, you know, I'm so interested and, and, and amazed by the fact that in the land of Gandhi, there is still so much widespread violence when the whole issue that Gandhi was uh, talking about was non-violent solutions, etc. So I'm sure the, probably the editor felt, now that is probably not the first time he heard such a comment from a Western visitor. Um, but the response I found very interesting. He said, you see, this is the fundamental and profound misunderstanding of our society. You think that Gandhi developed non-violence as a strategy because it somehow reflects an Indian tradition. He said it's the exact opposite. Gandhi understood the inherent violence contained in our society required a radically different strategy. And therefore, nonviolence was the antidote to something that Gandhi observed as being the, the, the cancer that was eating up the society. By the way, a cancer that isn't Indian, that is human, right? We see it everywhere. And this is, I think, an absolutely fundamental insight. It's like when people say, oh, well, you embrace pacifism. Didn't you read about Hitler? You know, and, but that's, no, of course, we all know. And we know about all the other wars. And we know about the genocide in Rwanda. So it's, nobody in this room, and certainly nobody who has worked in the field of conflict, is naive about the limitless ability of human beings to inflict horrors and suffering on other human beings. There we're fully documented. We know all about it. And that is exactly why we sometimes need to take radically different strategies than simply continuing to enable and to talk about. Now, humanitarian law is a reflection of realism about the fact that wars exist. But at times, I think we have to step out of that and embrace strategies that challenge the core of what human beings think is simply allowed. Because otherwise, we are it, it just becomes, I think, the, especially with these never-ending conflicts that we're dealing with, and again, Colombia, of course, was a very good example of that. Now, then the peace and justice, I, I have to say, I did not in my 
years in the humanitarian field deal with or sit down with a community as you would from the inside and have I've mean, been confronted with many we, we have the experiences out of Rwanda of course and what path Rwanda chose we know about the peace and reconciliation commissions and the dialogue that exists in South Africa and elsewhere and I think every society in a certain sense will define processes that are and I don't think any of these processes will ever be able to address the individual needs of everybody in the society. It's, it's impossible to imagine that. And that's where I think space has to be opened for, I think one of the most important things is the ability to state your case and to be listened to. Because so many times when the, the discussion takes place in the balance between peace and reconciliation, it is stated that you're looking for peace and therefore we will you know, leave the justice element aside and individuals are not given a chance to therefore ha have accountability uh, reached, but they're also not being given a chance to be listened to. And I can tell you, in the case of Israel and Palestine, one of the greatest problems today, and this is something to think about also in the practice of, and here it's maybe more in the field of human rights, but also maybe humanitarian law, but in particular human rights, you know, every time I would go into a meeting in the European Union, especially the, the Peace and uh, Security uh, Committee, um, it was still 28 in the room, um, and, and somebody would come, knowing that I would talk about the issue of Palestine refugees, somebody would come to whisper in my ears, please you know, just remember that in the room you will have a number of people who are closer to the Israeli perspectives and a number of countries who are closer to the Palestinian. And I said, fantastic, that's actually an asset. But people don't think about it in those terms. Why? Because those countries that are close to Israeli perspectives will address their criticism to the Palestinian behavior and vice versa. But that's totally, this is extraordinary in the international community. I've always seen it. It, it happens every time. You address your human rights related criticism to the side in the conflict over which you have the least influence. Mm -hmm. It's frankly, you can look at any conflict, you will see it. It's a pattern. You, you address because you, you've decided that that side is responsible for and therefore you will address the criticism. But you should be addressing your remarks to the side that is the closest to you if your interest is to shape a different outcome. But that's of course very often not the interest and that's what creates the polarization. Friends reinforce friends in the opinion that they're right about everything and address the criticism of human rights to the other side. It's a totally useless approach to resolving and addressing human consequences of conflict and addressing the consequences of those situations. And there, we really need to move into something that is, again, we have to shape a different understanding of it. We have to find different ways of influencing because this polarization, I can tell you, in, uh, just to stay one second with the Israel-Palestine paradigm. My first visit to Gaza as uh, Commissioner General of UNRWA was in May 2014. And my colleagues in the Gaza Strip had organized a meeting with business leaders in Gaza. And one of these business leaders started the, the meeting like this. He said, Commissioner General, I'm a good man. So, okay, so that's interesting. And he said, but... My, our, my children are not as good as I am. And that's, of course, something, first of all, you rarely hear, as don't expect, and it, you never forget. And so I asked him, what did he mean? He said, well, he said, I grew up, and I, as a Palestinian, am part of the generation where we may have had all our disagreements with Israelis, but we know each other. I worked in Israeli companies, I learned many of my business skills, he said, working with Israel. And regardless of all the paradigms of the occupation and the conflict, he said, I can still, and I'm quoting him, I can still pick up the phone today and call people that I know in Israel, and I can, we will disagree on most things, but I can still honestly say, and I'm quoting him very precisely, I can still honestly say that I, can, I think I can understand some of the concerns and I might disagree, still understand some of the worries that the Israeli side is expressing. He says, our children can no longer do that. Because in Gaza, they have never seen an Israeli in their life. The blockade and the siege is so absolute, they grow up 
The only thing they know of Israel is the wall, the occupation, the tanks, the drones, the destruction, the fear of a next intervention. And again, I'm saying this, this is not out of political observation. It's just the reality of young people growing up. And I have talked to Israelis who say, more or less, it's the same. Possibly, apart from, of course, the Israeli Arab community, but otherwise, they would today very rarely see a Palestinian other than maybe on a building site. The, the interactions are so limited and constrained. Now, you can say the generation that knew each, uh, one another didn't resolve the negotiation. Mm. So does it necessarily mean that those who don't know each other very well will fail? Maybe not. That I can't say. But the urgency to address, and this, the patience people often have about allowing time to pass. So imagine Colombia with another 10 years. You would have simply added to the number of families that would be today very, very worried about what is being done with peace. Will I also get justice? Was my relative who was kidnapped or murdered in the street or whatever, tortured in prison? Will we get justice in that regard? And so that is why I never have any sympathy for people explaining to me that it is difficult. Of course, negotiations are difficult. Think of the Iranian nuclear deal, not very popular in today's age, right? <laughs> but it's a very interesting, it is the one, and what I find so interesting in the process that led to the nuclear agreement on Iran is the following. You had countries and institutions like the United States, the European Union, the Russian Federation involved at the very time where those three actors were totally divided on Ukraine and Syria. So you would normally think there's just no way they're going to find a path, and yet they found it. Why? Because they considered this issue to be of such strategic importance and risk that they found the energies to overcome the divisions on other things and to work towards a solution. That is a hugely important lesson. So in other words, on Israel-Palestine, that is possible as well. And to simply allow people to be skeptical, I always said to ministers in Europe, skepticism is one of the least sophisticated forms of surrender that I'm aware of. And with the human consequences that I know of in these contexts, I cannot accept that to be the case. So there we need to re-inject energy into that so that we find at least some kind of middle ground between the peace and justice element that you highlight. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, I hope that you have had as much food for thought from the discussion as I have. Thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing those with us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.